Obstetrics and Gynecology. Paper in 1941, The Efficacy of Ultraviolet Blood Irradiation in Puerperal Sepsis. This is infection of the endometrial lining of the uterus following childbirth, also called septic endometritis. 13 patients at Shadyside Hospital in Pittsburgh treated with ultraviolet between July 1937 and May 1940. Now there have been two deaths in early 1937 beta hemolytic streptococcal septicemia. Nobody wanted to see that. Ultraviolet became available in the summer of 1937, so they could now apply this technique in puerperal sepsis. Between July of 37 and May of 1940, there were 2,500 total deliveries. 13 of the women developed puerperal sepsis. They all recovered. Um, uh, one of the 13 received sulfa therapy. Six received sulfa, and when it didn't work, ultraviolet. Six received ultraviolet uh, monotherapy. Um, and these are their fever curves, their spiking temperatures. You treat them with ultraviolet, they would promptly defervesce, as we would expect in any bacterial infection. Ultraviolet and septic abortion, uh, paper in 1942. 21 women receiving ultraviolet to address post abortion sepsis. And in medical terms, abortion means spontaneous abortion or miscarriage or an induced abortion. Eight of the women had spontaneous abortion, which we would term as miscarriage. One psychotic woman underwent a medically induced abortion to address sepsis. Nine individuals underwent non-medical abortion uh, with instrumentation. Two took abortifactant meds. One used meds and instrumentation. And again, these people didn't want to seek medical attention due to the social stigma and potential uh, legal implications, so they would come into the hospital pretty much at death's door. Now, all 21 were ill with infectious signs and symptoms, 11 with early to a moderately advanced infection, 10 with advanced infection, uh, more of an infection. All 21 underwent surgical evacuation of the infected endometrial tissue, which we would call a DNC. Four developed fever after the DNC. You're cutting into this devitalized infected tissue, so you're going to experience sepsis and a fever. Um, three of the four had positive blood cultures. You treat them with ultraviolet, they resolve promptly. So it works well with sepsis post-DNC, so then they got a little bit wiser and said, well, let's just treat you with ultraviolet. Before the DNC, in 17, they received ultraviolet. They had the DNC, no infectious signs or symptoms post-surgery. The microbes cultured from the affected tissues in her blood were a wide variety of microbes, E. coli, strep, staph aureus, pneumococcus, diphthroids, and indifferent streptococcus. I have no idea what a diphthroid is or an indifferent streptococcus. We don't use those terms today, but I thought it was kind of interesting um, what they used back then in their terminology, so I put that in. But anyways, septic abortion, where there's retained um, fetal tissue that's infected, high morbidity and mortality, ultraviolet worked quite well. Pelvic cellulitis. In 1947, this is the work of Dr. Olney in, uh, in Lincoln, Nebraska, he felt that pelvic cellulitis was the most common chronic complaint amongst women who would consult him. This was inflammation of the female reproductive apparatus, typically the um, ovarian tubes, we call that salpingitis, or the ovaries or the uterus. This could range from dysmenorrhea, painful cramping with menses, to pelvic inflammatory disease, which is inflammation of the fallopian tubes. With chronic or recurrent infection, there could be damage to the tubes, abscess formation, or sterility. This could be gonococcal due to gonorrhea, or mixed bacterial, which is the more likely etiology. And pelvic cellulitis was often recurrent because in a woman who's sexually active, there's a chronic route of entry of skin or GI tract um, bacteria into the female reproductive organs. Now, you could treat pelvic cellulitis with standard antibiotic therapy. That'll kill microbes, but it will also alter your host flora. Whenever we give you an antibiotic, we kill the bug, and we kill the good bugs in your intestines, allowing bad bugs and yeast to gain a toehold, and then that would set you up for recurrent infection, urinary tract infections, or pelvic infection. And of course, antibiotics do not increase host resistance. If anything, they will lower your host resistance. Ultraviolet kills invading microbes, 
negligible effect on the normal flora. And again, it's not dividing rapidly. It doesn't pick up a toxic dose of ultraviolet. And ultraviolet does increase your immune defenses. So only utilized ultraviolet to treat pelvic cellulitis, 631 patients, 173 with mild, 238 with moderately severe, 220 with severe infection. Treatment protocol, ultraviolet every two to four weeks for a total of two to six treatments, once or twice a week for those with severe acute inflammation, once a month for three months in women with chronic uh, pelvic cellulitis. Surgery only if an abscess, tumor, cyst, or another structural process is suspected. And if he was going to carry out surgery, you would receive ultraviolet one day pre-op, one day post-op. And with the sandwiching the surgery into the ultraviolet therapy, there was a smoother course with less nausea, less paralysis of the GI tract, less requirement for bed rest and pain medication. Morbidity was decreased by 50%. He carried out these surgeries and did not use antibiotics. He relied instead on ultraviolet. Now, outcomes, 174 women with mild disease. Here, this is chronic mild pelvic infection, severe dysmenorrhea, pelvic tenderness, but no masses, no abscesses. Of the 173 women, 151 noted a full resolution of their symptoms, their, their uh, menstrual cramps uh, resolved, tenderness resolved and examined, improved sense of well-being. 17 were improved, six were lost to follow-up. We will presume they didn't get better. That's why they didn't come back. Among 17 women with at least two years of sterility due to prior inflammation and infection of the fallopian tubes, all 17 conceived, and they, and they had a normal pregnancy and delivery. There were five cases of threatened miscarriage, um, recurrent pain and hemorrhage. He treated these pregnant women with ultraviolet. Their pregnancy normalized with term deliveries. Now, miscarriage involves immune dysregulation and clotting within the placenta. Ultraviolet, as we'll learn later, inhibits abnormal clotting and quiets down the immune system so it makes sense that ultraviolet would be effective in threatened miscarriage, and indeed it was in five of these patients. 238 women with moderately severe disease, months to years of recurrent symptoms, swelling and tenderness over the pelvic organs, many with prior surgery. Of the 238 women with moderately severe disease, 191 enjoyed full resolution, pain, swelling, tenderness resolved, normal function of their pelvic organs, 24 were improved, 23 were lost to fault, presumably they did not improve. Um, 220 women with very severe non-gonococcal pelvic cellulitis, recurrent attacks of pain, months to years in duration, swelling and tenderness over the pelvic structures, many with prior surgery, 174 enjoyed full resolution, pain, swelling, and tenderness gone, normal function of the pelvic organs, returned sense of well-being, 24 improved, 22 improved but they required surgery, and they found cysts, fibroids, or other structural abnormalities. So it was quite effective in the treatment of pelvic cellulitis. A couple uh, case studies, 33-year-old mother of two operated on five years earlier for left-sided salpingeal ophritis, that's infection of the tubes and ovaries, returns with an identical mass on the right the size of an orange. Mark tenderness on exam, pain elevated temperature, she receives ultraviolet, pain's gone in two days, second ultraviolet, full resolution of her chronic symptoms. Three unmarried, unmarried girls who were not sexually active had pain and masses over their ovaries. Single ultraviolet, signs and symptoms resolved in 48 hours without recurrence. 46-year-old mother of three with severe dys dysmenorrhea as a girl, four spontaneous miscarriages, severe PMS. In um, Miley's terms, the patient suffered intensely each month, sex was painful, large mass filling the pelvis. She received ultraviolet periodically over six weeks. The mass and pain fully resolved. Sex was no longer painful. She felt better than she had, in her words, for as long as I could remember. In Dr. Olney's opinion, in his 25 years of practice, he has never found any treatment for chronic pel pelvic cellulitis that compares with the NOT technique as approved by the American Blood Irradiation Society. All the early ultraviolet doctors got together and formed the American Blood Irradiation Society. Ultraviolet and polycystic ovarian syndrome, PCOS. This is a Russian paper published in 1992. It has not been fully translated. The summary was translated, and I did the best I could from the uh, information available. 119 women with PCOS receiving a total of 582 ultraviolet treatments. 25 were followed for 1 to 25 months. They had 23 control subjects who did not get better. They 
enjoyed what the research described as a good clinical effect in 89%. Recovery of the monthly cycle in 71%. So 41 were amenorrheic, they were not cycling. In 71% or 20 out of the 41 monthly cycles return. Resolution of headache in 86%. Return of fertility in 29%. Decrease in hirsutism, this is unwanted hair growth due to the high androgen uh, levels in PCOS. Uh, improved in 19%, weight reduction in 40%, blood pressure fell, androgen levels and gonadotropin secretion improved. So the pituitary gland and the hypothalamus was affected. Again, we're treating the circulation. The cells in the circulation are giving off secondary emanations, treating the nervous system and the endocrine system. Frick was a German researcher who you clinician who used ultraviolet in the treatment of migraine. And he noted that normalization of the menstrual cycle was a side benefit of the use of ultraviolet treatment of migraine. Nine to 30 women desiring children and they were, they were, who were sterile re achieved regular cycles after ultraviolet, 10 more if you added hormonal therapy to ultraviolet. So ultraviolet lends itself to disorders of OBGYN, particularly gynecologic infection. We'll move on to the next section that discusses the utilization of ultraviolet in the treatment of phlebitis, that's inflammation of the venous system, wounds, and improving one's response to surgery. Phlebitis, wounds, and surgery. What's thrombophlebitis? This refers to inflammation, often with clot formation, of the veins. We have the superficial venous system, those are veins on your skin that you can see, and the deep venous system. The deep venous system is more functionally important. 80% of the drainage of blood from your extremities goes through the deep venous system. Now, we can have superficial thrombophlebitis, such as with an infected IV. There's inflammation, there's a clot formation, a superficial vein, you'll have painful cords. Of greater concern is deep venous thrombosis. When the deep veins are inflamed and clot forms, the drainage of the entire limb is compromised and you'll have a large, swollen, inflamed, red-hot limb, often with secondary bacterial uh, infection. Now, first paper came out in 1943, 13 consecutive patients undergoing ultraviolet blood irradiation therapy for acute thrombophlebitis, infection and clotting of veins. And again, thrombophlebitis is venous inflammation, with or without clot, there's pain, tenderness, and fever, and it's typically of sudden onset after surgery, infection, or delivery. When you're not up and moving about, blood flow is sluggish, it's, there's a predisposition then to clot formation, so we often see uh, thrombophlebitis or DVT, deep venous thrombosis, following surgery. Treatment in 1943 involved bed rest with limb elevation, local heat, Sulf antibiotics, they use sulf antibiotics for just about everything then, and nerve blocks. You might have intense pain, so we would want to inject a local anesthetic to dull your appreciation of pain. There also may be a problem with autonomic dysfunction with the veins constricting, so nerve blocks would, would alter the autonomic tone and the veins would dilate. Now today we would treat you with blood thinners, heparin and coumadin, but they didn't have blood thinners back then. So deep venous thrombosis and thrombophlebitis were quite dreadful conditions when they would occur. Now, amongst Dr. Miley's 13 patients, three were non-responsive to bed rest elevation and local heat, five were non-responsive to the above plus sulfa antibiotics, one was non-responsive to the above plus four nerve blocks, four received only ultraviolet and bed rest. In all 13, signs and symptoms improved in a predictable fashion. Pain resolved in 12 to 48 hours, Tenors over the vein two to six hours after pain resolved. Fever was gone in one to two days. Edema was the last to resolve over one to ten days. Why would it work? Well, ultraviolet's bactericidal. It's oxygenating. It detoxifies. There's benefits on autonomic function. Now, healthy individuals and ill individuals, when we treat you, you'll flush because there's cutaneous vasodilatation. Um, and this is not just due to treating your skin, we're treating you systemically. If you apply ultraviolet to the skin of frogs, they will vasodilate in their skin and in their internal organs. If you exsanguinate them, so blood cannot 
release secondary photons of irradiation in the internal organs, they will still vasodilate because you're affecting the autonomic nervous system. If, you, if a human has post-operative or post-infection ileus, their bowels are paralyzed, that will rapidly normalize with ultraviolet. So there's a normalizing effect on the autonomic nervous system, so any venoconstriction would resolve. Ultraviolet provides central and peripheral normalizing effects on the autonomic nervous system, and the sooner the treatment, the shorter the recovery time. In 1949, they published eight additional cases of acute and chronic thrombophlebitis, similar positive results, and they found that the recovery time was longer with chronic disease because there would be some structural damage to the veins. A couple cases. 25-year-old woman with bilateral femoral vein thrombophlebitis post-childbirth. So the femoral veins, the veins in the groin, both legs were involved. She has a temperature of 103. Her white count's 30,000. The upper lumen normal is 10,000. Her respiratory rate's 40. It should be 12. Her pulse is 160. She's toxic in appearance. Pain, tenors, swimming over both legs. Ultraviolet treatment 48 hours later, she defervesces. The white count falls. She's less toxic. Her respiratory rate falls to 24. Her pulse to 120. Follow, this was followed by resolution of pain, tenors, and swelling with an uneventful convalescence. 35-year-old man with a 12-year history of bilateral saphenous vein and femoral vein thrombophlebitis. His whole leg was involved. Prior therapy with bed rest, antibiotics, vein scarification and stripping. They did injection therapy. They tried to pull the veins out. It didn't work. This is a chronic problem, so he's not acutely ill. So his temperature is normal, but there's pain, swelling, and tenors over both legs. He got a single ultraviolet. 36 hours later, pain's much better, fully resolved at four weeks. Swelling was not fully resolved because the veins had been damaged by the prior stripping and scarification. He had one exacerbation. He had a second ultraviolet. Two days later, symptoms resolved. So after 12 years of this chronic venous inflammation, two ultraviolets resolved the whole uh, condition. Well, if ultraviolet is good in treating acute thrombophlebitis, inflammation, with or without infection or clotting within the venous system, would ultraviolet be a value in the prevention of thrombophlebitis? Um, paper published in 1951, the work of uh, doctors Rebeck and his colleagues at Shadyside Hospital in Pittsburgh. Now, beginning in February 46, they adopted a policy of carrying out a preventative ultraviolet prior to surgery in all major surgical cases, aiming to prevent post-op infection, toxemia, or phlebitis. They would receive ultraviolet one day pre-op and then post-op only as needed. So over a two and a half year period, their group carried out 575 major procedures, including 104 hysterectomies. And at that point, hysterectomy was associated with a fairly high incidence of post-op thrombophlebitis. Now they had only three episodes of thrombophlebitis or pulmonary embolism in their two and a half year experience. And in none of these three patients was the problem apparent at the time of hospital discharge. They returned with the problem. Two had lower extremity um, thrombophlebitis following hysterectomy. One, a diabetic man, experienced a lethal pulmonary embolism 10 days post-op. And when he was discharged, his legs looked great, but he had an early clot. It propagated, it broke off to his lungs and killed him with a pulmonary embolism. So they were kind of unhappy about this. Routine pre-op ultraviolet was a great value, but it wasn't fully protecting the patients. So they learned from their experience, and beginning in June 48, all their patients received ultraviolet one day pre-op and routinely one day post-op. So over the following three years, they carried out 802 major procedures, including 153 hysterectomies, no thrombophlebitis, no pulmonary embolism. So that became their standard of care. Ultraviolet one day pre, one day post-op, their patients did well no thrombophlebitis or pulmonary embolism. Ultraviolet is a value in chronic non-healing wounds. I'm going to give you some case studies because these are some really dramatic responses to ultraviolet. 37-year-old um, woman with a 7-centimeter discharging fistula of the terminal ileum. There was chronic inflammation and infection. There was a fistula communication between the intestine and the abdominal wall. So fecal material would be draining out through the abdominal wall. Not a really good thing when you're a 33-year-old. Now, in 1920, at the age of 24, she'd undergone an appendectomy. Two years later, she required laparotomy, surgical exploration, to deal with adhesions. Whenever the bowel was operated on, 
fibrous tissue can form so the bowel walls can um, lock in together and um, th then the, the bowel can twist upon itself causing abdominal obstruction. So they relieved the adhesions in 22. In 33, she had another problem. She had a chocolate ovarian cyst removed. The early pathologists like to describe pathology in terms of food. They don't do that today, but I thought that was kind of interesting. Two weeks after the ovarian cyst was removed, she requires surgery for an abdominal abscess that was drained. Three weeks later, she required a laparotomy for pain. They didn't find anything. There was fecal discharge at the incision site, another laparotomy to drain a large abscess. Three months later, she's discharged home. The fistula is still open and draining. In 35, she had three more surgeries that were not successful. She went to Norway to see a world-renowned surgeon, and he treated her, and it helped. The fistula closed for six months and then came back. In 1940, she comes back to Pittsburgh, depressed, weak. There's a large draining fistula, and she's cachectic. She's toxic in appearance. Her blood pressure is low. And the plan, they, they didn't have ultraviolet, so they were going to treat with ultraviolet, followed by surgery, which she later refused. So they give her one ultraviolet in July. They give her another one in August, and she was doing better. Third ultraviolet in October, the fistula is open but free of discharge, and it looks like it was healing. She had a fourth ultraviolet in December of 1940. For the next three years, the, his, the fistula remained healed with ultraviolet maintenance therapy twice a year. She had her last ultraviolet in 44, and they followed her for three years, and she was enjoying good health. So after this chronic poorly healing or non-healing abdominal wound, ultraviolet therapy promoted healing and the fistula closed and it did not come back. 20-year-old woman with a persistent abdominal surgical wound. In 1920, she had a laparotomy. Um, in, then in October of 1940, she had an acute abdomen and there were adhesions from the prior laparotomy that were treated. Um, in August of 41, she comes in, she has a draining sinus. So the, 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 there was not a communication with the bowel, but the wound had not fully healed. It was infected, draining, purulent material. So they do their best to excise it, but they don't get it completely. In October, there's persistent drainage. The patient's chronically ill. She can't eat. She's depressed. She can't sleep. So they didn't know what else to do. They packed the sinus with um, gauze containing iodine, and then they treat her with ultraviolet and she slept well for the first time in months and regained some energy. They discharged her with the wound packed but still draining. They did a second ultraviolet a month later. She's regaining weight. The anorexia is resolving. She's sleeping well. They extirpated the sinus tract in 40. This time it healed up and it didn't come back. 39-year-old woman with suppurative osteomyelitis and cellulitis, that is an infection of the bone draining pus to the skin with surrounding infection of the skin. Patient presents in July of 1940. She's cachectic. She looks like death warmed over. She's pale. Her heart rate's 120. There are draining lesions in her right elbow and left thigh. This is chronic infection with pus draining of the surface. X-ray shows bone loss, and the blood and wounds were positive for staph. So she gets her first ultraviolet. Nothing happens. A few months later, she's really sick. She's having gallbladder trouble, biliary colic, generalized arthritis. The wounds enlarged despite topical sulfa therapy and zinc, general deterioration. So they gave her second ultraviolet, you know, out of desperation, and to the surprise of the doctor, she felt better, but the wounds did not heal. Three months later, she gets a third treatment at her request. She gains some strength. A fourth treatment, a fifth treatment, she heals up. They discharge her home, 13 additional treatments, full resolution of the bone and skin infection with a normal recovery. And she would have died without ultraviolet with these chronic uh, bone infections not responding to standard antibiotic therapy. Ultraviolet and fracture non-union. Ultraviolet will speed the healing of bones. 38-year-old man in a motor vehicle accident, he has a laceration of his skin and the tendon of his right forearm. His right femur, the right thigh, is fractured. They suture him up, they suture up the tendon, it heals, but the skin does not heal. It remains open and infected, and the bone doesn't knit. So the bone uh, fracture is not healing. In April of 1940, they treat him with an ultraviolet. The arm begins to fill in and uh, heals up. A few months later, they repeat the x-ray, and the bone is beginning to heal up. He was discharged from in good condition. 
so his skin infection improved and it helped speed up bone healing as well. Um, so if it's working in all these chronic wounds, what about x-ray burns? Codman was a pathologist in 1902 that described skin inflammation or dermatitis following massive or often repeated small doses of therapeutic x-ray. Wolbach studied the histology of x-ray dermatitis and basically there's damage to the skin, the subdermal tissue, the blood vessels fibrose, the normal structure is, is uh, replaced by scar tissue, there's proliferation of the scar tissue because the skin is scaly and horny in appearance. And that's radiation damage to the skin because ionizing x-ray is ionizing radiation. It won't just elevate an electron to a higher orbital. It blows the electron away and destroys the, um, the atoms and the molecules. Um, Miley and 54 described benefits of ultraviolet wound healing. Hancock observed more prompt wound healing with preoperative ultraviolet. We know that it helps um, stimulate the healing of bones. It promotes deposition of calcium in bones. There's a general regenerative effect of ultraviolet on muscle, bone, and skin tissue. So let's try ultraviolet following x-ray or radium burns. Mrs. R.P., age 62 at the time the paper was presented in 1950. In 1934, when she was 53, she received two radium treatments followed by hysterectomy. This was a full abdominal hysterectomy her tubes and ovaries were removed, she had a malignancy. And in pathology, there was a two by one and a half centimeter malignant tumor hanging onto a thread of tissue within the uterus. So she had had an endometrial malignancy. Um, as a side effect of the radiation, she had a rectal ulceration that persisted for six years. Whenever she attempted to evacuate her bowel, she had severe pain. She had her first ultraviolet in January of 41, Within five weeks, this chronic rectal ulcer was completely healed. She could eliminate her bowels without difficulty. She has a second ultraviolet six months later. The lesions remained healed, and she enjoyed good health over the next nine years. Mrs. W. O., age 41 at present, in 1936, when she was pregnant, she received external x-ray therapy for warty growth around the vulva and rectum. Now, we wouldn't have done that today because it could have been damaging the fetus, but this is what they did back, back then and then the child was delivered by C-section. And that then she developed radiation injury to the vulvar and the rectal region. When she's evaluated in March of 44, the left labia was raw and sore. There was a strip of inflamed tissue five by one and a half inches um, in dimension. Her anal sphincter was spastic. She had trouble eliminating. She required enemas. She receives the first ultraviolet, healing and good health over the following five years of observation. Five years later, in 49, she presents with an abscess, but no evidence of recurrent tumor. Second ultraviolet, rapid and complete healing. One year later, there's a small uh, recurrent lesion, another ultraviolet, full healing in two weeks. So these patients with chronic radiation damage to their lower GI tract and, and to their pelvic organs had a full recovery with ultraviolet. Mrs. H required a mastectomy and x-ray treatment for breast malignancy. As a result of, of these therapies that saved her life, she has a large weeping lesion the size of two palms over the left chest, resistant to healing. She receives one ultraviolet. The weeping of the skin ceases at 12 days with definite signs of healing. Second ultraviolet at two weeks, third at four weeks, complete healing, no, no recurrence at two years. Dr. E.T., a dentist, used x-ray to treat one of his patients and he got his anterior right index finger. So he has the six-year-old burn. The skin is thickened. The skin's fissured. Movement's painful. Numbness, loss of sensitivity. They had recommended plastic surgery and skin grafting. He declined that, sought out a physician skilled in ultraviolet. In January 50, he began a program of ultraviolet every four weeks for four months. With chronic illness, we will treat you uh, less frequently, but longer. With acute illness, we treat you you know, once or twice a week for a shorter period of time. So at three weeks, the fissures in his finger creases healed, less skin thickening. At six weeks, tactile sensation return. At six months, the finger's back to normal. Bursitis and tendonitis calcara. This is a report in 1951 involving the use of ultraviolet in acute and chronic deltoid bursitis. Now the deltoid bursa is a sac-like cavity containing viscous fluid at the friction point between the deltoid muscle and the head of the humerus, that's the, uh, the upper arm bone. And you, you will develop bursitis as a result of stress, inflammation, injury, and the effects of aging, 
on the tendons in the region, and these make up the rotator cuff. So there's going to be damage and degeneration. Necrosis means uh, inappropriate cell death within the tendon fibers, and then calcification will occur because there's no energy. And they form these rice-like calcific bodies in the tendons. They will work their way up to the surface and rupture into the bursa. And that's when you have the pain, swelling, and restriction of, of motion. And you can see calcification on the x-ray. This is an MRI showing inflammation. And it's really a natural process to get the calcium out of the tendon, but when it dumps into the bursa, you have inflammation and pain. So 22 consecutive unselected cases of deltoid bursitis, some of which had calcification of the tendons. 18 were acute, 4 were chronic, and they're all miserable. They're hurting all the time. You roll over in bed. You have acute pain, so you're not sleeping. So you treat them with ultraviolet. Those with acute uh, deltoid bursitis and tendonitis get weekly therapy for two weeks and then every two weeks for a month. Those with chronic conditions get monthly therapy until all pain dis disappears and then yearly for three to four years. Of those, 91% uh, improved. 17 out of 18 with acute bursitis, three out of four with chronic disease. So it's healing these chronic sterile musculoskeletal wounds as well as surgical wounds and the sequelae of infection. With acute bursitis, Pain usually disappears in one to six hours. A second treatment, two to three days later, occasionally a third treatment. Calcification begins to clear. So that as you're revitalizing the tissues, the calcification leaves. The insomnia resolves with pain relief. With chronic bursitis, pain begins to subside within a few days, slower clearing of calcification. Why did it work? Well, there's rapid relief of the edematous process. There's less swelling. There's increased oxygen carrying capacity to the blood. And so you get oxygen in the tissues and the bursa to promote healing, vasodilatation to improve capillary blood flow, and there's the generalized healing effect of ultraviolet. Ultraviolet will inactivate toxins. When you're sick, much of the toxicity are toxic molecules elaborated by the viruses or the bacteria. In botulism, a toxin is released that paralyzes the nervous system and kills you. Here's a report in 1946, the use of ultraviolet to reverse botulism coma. 27-year-old was admitted to LA County General Hospital in November of 43 in critical condition. Seven days earlier, she had had a meal at home of canned beet tops that were inadequately prepared and contaminated with the botulism um, uh, microbe. So at, at day, six days before coming in, she's starting to get sick with nausea and vomiting. Then her vision's blurred, she's having trouble swallowing, she can't walk. They bring her in, semi-comatose, unable to swallow, unable to see, and they diagnosed her with terminal botulism, and there was no treatment available at the time, and they anticipated she would die. Well, they had this ultraviolet machine that was working pretty well in polio and other otherwise untreatable conditions, so they treat her, and she gets better. The neurologic toxicity is resolved, and she's discharged home and enjoying good health. The, the bacteria was gone at this point, but she was dying of the toxin. Ultraviolet will inactivate toxins. It also apparently is good in dealing with, with uh, snake bite toxicity. Preventing amputation in diabetic gangrene, paper 1952. 26 patients treated by Dr. Olney in Nebraska over an eight-year period. And diabetic gangrene could be described as diabetic endarteritis with various degrees of occlusion and gangrene of the blood vessels. Pulsation of the dorsalis pedis and posterior tibial pulse is imperceptible. That's the pulse on the top and the side of your foot. So blood flow was severely impaired uh, due to the diabetic process, and they, most of them, it was anticipated they would need amputation, and they're all receiving the best possible dietary and insulin therapy for their diabetes. Now, 12 of the 26 patients received standard care and eight of the 12 required amputation, two died, one from pulmonary embolism, one from kidney failure. 14 received standard therapy and ultraviolet, and only one of 14 required amputation. The other 13 were discharged home with a functional limb. This was not randomized or blah, 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 but the cases were matched as disease severity, and it's quite a remarkable uh, benefit. Mrs. ML, age 54, was receiving the best possible diabetic management presents with left leg gangrene above the ankle with ulceration required amputation. Her right foot at that time had less severe disease. Now, the pulses were absent, her feet were swollen reddish blue, and the ends of her toes were beginning, her, were beginning to slough off from gangrene, but the foot was still viable. 
She receives ultraviolet and at two months, swelling and discoloration resolve, pulses return, treatments continued for some time, then she felt better, stopped coming back. She comes back a year later after developing the flu and her symptoms had recurred and she presents three weeks into this, the right leg is swollen to the knee, it's discolored, there's no pulses, there's two areas of gangrene, her toes are sloughing off, her blood sugar is totally out of control despite a high insulin dose. Whenever you have an infection that aggravates your insulin resistance, um, vision's poor from diabetic retinopathy, um, her white count's elevated, her belly's descended, she has jaundice, so there's some problem in her liver or gallbladder. Um, she was certainly um, morbid, and you know, the optimum therapy would have been amputation, get rid of this dying tissue, but she was too sick. They were afraid to put her under because of the jaundice and her sepsis and her high sugar. Um, so the plan was to tune her up with ultraviolet and then amputate. So she gets ultraviolet every other day for a week, swelling and redness subside, full recovery at four weeks, her sugar improves, her white count falls, her vision comes back, her belly clears, the jaundice goes away, she has a full function recovery, and they did not require amputation. Hence the, the power of ultraviolet blood irradiation therapy. Beneficial effects of ultraviolet and diabetic vascular disease. Well, if you'll clear secondary skin or bone infection, promotes tissue oxygenation, it dilates blood vessels, promotes wound healing, and increases your constitutional resistance. Treatment frequency was not well described in the article, but what I could glean was you get two treatments a week till you get better, then weekly till functional recovery, maintenance ultraviolet every two to three weeks, and you come in immediately if you get any infection. And these patients that would heal up if they get any sort of infection, that would seem to um, upregulate inflammation. You know, when a diabetic gets sick, their insulin uh, sensitivity falls and things get out of control. So he advised prompt ultraviolet if you have any recurrent infection. Preoperative ultraviolet, this is described as the Revic effect after Dr. Revic, who practiced at Shadyside. And he published a paper in 1943 involving 1,500 patients who had received a total of 4,500 ultraviolet treatments. He found that preoperative ultraviolet was of great value in expediting surgical recovery if you had to cut into infected tissue. If you had acute rheumatic fever or rheumatic arthritis from rheumatic fever and you had infected tonsils, adenoids, and teeth, the surgery would, would cause septicemia and would flare up the acute rheumatic fever. But if he pretreated you with ultraviolet, he could carry out the surgery without a flare-up. Uh, extraction of infected teeth um, in high-risk patients was smoother with preoperative ultraviolet. Toxic goiter. If you had hyperthyroidism in 1943, they didn't have drugs to quiet down the thyroid. So the treatment was to cut out half of the thyroid to eliminate the thyroid toxicosis. But you go into the surgery in thyroid storm with a fever, high heart rate, so the mortality was quite high. But if he treated you with ultraviolet, that would tone down the immune system. Most individuals with toxic hypothyroidism, it's autoimmune. So it would stand to reason that ultraviolet would quiet it down, just as it quiets down asthma and rheumatic fever. So he would treat them, and then they would do better with the surgery. Acute cholecystitis, acute gallbladder obstruction inflammation, lymphangitis, in, in inflammation of the lymphatic system, or incomplete septic abortion, he would treat you before surgery with ultraviolet, and later on they learned to treat you after surgery. Paper in 1950, ultraviolet prior to biliary tract surgery. This refers to the gallbladder and the biliary tree. 336 consecutive patients undergoing biliary surgery over a three and a half year period. Now the first 226 received standard therapy, the best practices at the time, um, pre and post-op. Then the second 110 received standard therapy plus ultraviolet, one day pre-op and one day post-op. Complication rates were much lower in the ultraviolet group. The need for gastric suction post-op fell from 33% to 2%. Abdominal dissension fell. You're less likely to have fever. Mortality was 2.2% with best standard therapy. Best standard therapy plus ultraviolet, the mortality was less than 1%. They divided their patients into those with acute cholecystitis versus chronic disease. And um, mortality with acute disease with conventional therapy was 6%. Um, in chronic disease, it was 1%, but it was 0% when 
with acute or chronic gallbladder disease requiring surgery with perioperative ultraviolet blood irradiation. Why would it work? Well, it prevents thrombophlebitis, it promotes wound healing, it increases the ability of the white cells to gobble up and kill microbes, it promotes blood and tissue oxygenation, it prevents post-op ileus, it opens up the autonomic nervous system, it reduces bacterial toxins, it improves the microcirculation, increases general resistance, and of course there's really no downside to ultraviolet, thus their policy ultraviolet pre and post-op, their patients did better. Um, we'll now move on to a discussion of the use of ultraviolet blood aeration in the treatment of cardiovascular disease. Cardiovascular disease. Now, I'm a cardiologist, so of course my greatest interest is the utilization of ultraviolet blood irradiation as a concomitant therapy in cardiovascular disease. But this will be the weakest part of our presentation, at least in terms of documentation. Um, I'll present American case reports and discussions, but we have no published papers in the American literature regarding the use of ultraviolet in cardiovascular disease. However, after we forgot about ultraviolet around 1950, the Germans and the Russians embraced this methodology and their, the great bulk of ultraviolet research, modern day ultraviolet research, comes from uh, the Soviet Union and uh, East Germany, clinical trials and basic science. Now, there are some modifications of the ultraviolet procedure, major autohemotherapy, which we'll talk about later. There's a Canadian company that's trying to utilize that um, and under the trade name of Azocare, laser blood irradiation. Now what the Russians will do, they will thread a fiber optic cable into your vein. It's a very, very thin fiber optic cable like an IV wire. And they thread it into your heart. And they will pulse a laser frequency into your blood. Now with ultraviolet blood irradiation, we're applying a wide variety of frequencies with laser therapy, laser is coherent light, it's a single frequency. But if you have the right frequency to carry out a condition, you can treat the blood with a laser frequency and get a clinical response. Or you could apply many different frequencies. And I'll present some papers showing benefits of laser blood irradiation. As an, as, as an improvement on this technique, they have transcutaneous laser blood irradiation. Now remember with heliotherapy, with Rollier at the turn of the century, you treat the skin, there's a systemic effect. So the, the Russians could put a fiber optic cable into your blood and treat your blood, or you could shine a laser device on your skin, treat the skin and the blood in the capillaries beneath the skin, and you're treating the entire body. And most of these papers have been published in German and eventually I'm going to get together with a Russian colleague and go through these and learn what frequencies they use because we can do this in the United States. Soft laser therapy is available in the United States and it's FDA approved. This is an Arconia derma laser that will apply a laser frequency your skin. I don't know if you can see this or not. We can program four different frequencies, violet and red, and treat the skin. And it is FDA approved in the treatment of acne. You will treat your skin and you will treat your abdominal wall. Why do you treat your abdominal wall? Because the bacteria that cause acne, acne live in the GI tract. And this was demonstrated to be beneficial in acne and now it's FDA approved. Well, you can program any combination of frequencies you want into this device and use it to treat different conditions. So it's kind of like ultraviolet blood irradiation of the skin confined to specific frequencies. And you can determine what frequencies work best with different conditions. I'm going to find out what frequencies the Russians used. I can program this into the, the frequencies in this device and I can treat you. Now, um, there's another device we have called frequency-specific microcurrent, where we apply electrodes to your skin and run current through your body. And this is similar to the TENS unit that is used for pain. But with frequency-specific microcurrent, we're applying current at a, a very weak power, 1 1,000th one to 1 6,000th the power of a TENS unit. And that's the key. This very low level of current causes the frequencies that run through your body 
to interact with physiologic processes and we can increase and decrease the rate of physiologic processes. So it's similar to laser blood irradiation, transcutaneous laser irradiation, and ultraviolet blood irradiation therapy. We're, we're exploiting principles of physics to improve our physiology and our biology and to improve outcomes in our patients who are ill. The, most of the Russian and German studies were published using the Isolda device. And here the IV is placed in your vein and there's a pump that will pull blood out of your vein. It's treated with ultraviolet. The blood runs through a quartz cuvette which this is a, a quartz cuvette used by the Isolda device, so it's a very narrow uh, uh, layer of blood is treated with the ultraviolet light. It is then, the blood is captured in a bottle, it's anticoagulated, then we flip it upside down and use gravity for the blood to go back through the device. You get a second pass back in your blood. We had one of these devices and we've used it. And then we replaced it with the American device. And I wanted to show you the device but it's missing. We can't find it in the office. I don't know what happened to it, but I've heard rumor that there's a physician in southern Michigan who has an Isolda device. I wonder who that could be. We will have to investigate. Um, benefits of ultraviolet and cardiovascular disease. Improves oxygenation and oxidation utilization. Arterial oxygenation increases. Red cell 2,3 DPG increases. Tissue utilization of oxygen picks up. Energy metabolism improves. Lactate and pyruvate levels fall. In other words, you're burning sugar and fat more completely. You're making ATP energy. You're using it. It improves the circulation. We get vasodilatation by relaxing vascular smooth muscle via our autonomic effect. Blood flow characteristics improve. The rheology of the blood improves. Your blood becomes more like wine and less like ketchup. Platelets are less sticky. Red cells are more deformable so they can wiggle through narrowed blood vessels. The blood's less viscous. Fibrinolytic capacity, the ability of your blood to dissolve clots improves. And of course, there's a rebound antioxidant effect when we treat you with ultraviolet. We understand that atherosclerosis is not due to high cholesterol. Rather, atherosclerotic vascular disease is a maladaptive response to the immune system to what it perceives as infection of the artery wall with oxidized, glycated, or modified cholesterol. Atherosclerosis is essentially an autoimmune disease. Heart failure always involves autoimmune attack against the damaged heart muscle. So cardiovascular disease, like asthma, like rheumatic fever, is autoimmune in nature. We know that ultraviolet blood aeration downregulates the immune response when it's inappropriately elevated, thus there's going to be immune modulation effects of ultraviolet in cardiovascular conditions. Ultraviolet effects on cholesterol and platelet function. Now we know that high cholesterol is not the cause of arterial disease. It's cholesterol that infiltrates the artery wall that becomes modified, trapped, and oxidized. But all things being equal, the higher your cholesterol level, the more can enter the artery wall and incite the atherosclerotic riot. Also, high cholesterol is a sign of poor health. When you're a kid, you ate junk food and you had a low cholesterol, you had a low blood pressure. It, in middle age, you're paying attention to your diet, yet your cholesterol and blood pressure are rising. This is because over the decades, you've accumulated toxins, heavy metals, organic pollutants, pesticides, herbicides. Your liver's not working so well and you have high cholesterol. So any therapy that lowers cholesterol by improving your physiology would be a plus. Um, platelet function. Platelets initiate clotting. In patients with atherosclerosis, the platelets are sticky. They're more likely to aggregate and form a clot. Let's see what effect ultraviolet has on cholesterol and platelet function. 125 East German patients with symptomatic atherosclerotic vascular disease. The paper has not been completely translated. The summary has been translated. I did the best I could with the paper. It appears they received 14 ultraviolet treatments over one year, weekly for six weeks, monthly for four months, and then four more treatments over the following six months. This is the, the table from the uh, paper, and you can see cholesterol falls from 275 to 245 to 235 to 220. Why did the cholesterol fall? I don't know. Probably because liver health had improved, 
or perhaps the, under the influence of ultraviolet, cholesterol was being converted into downstream steroid hormones like testosterone or estradiol or uh, pregnenolone. Platelet count didn't fall, but platelet aggregation, platelet stickiness, the likelihood that platelets would form abnormal clots decreased. So with ultraviolet, cholesterol falls, platelet function improves. How will this help our patients with vascular disease? Here we're going to look at a paper published in 1992 from East Germany. 30 patients with Fontaine II intermittent claudication. That means they had moderate symptoms. Claudication is angina of the calves. There's a blockage in the arterial flow to your legs. So when you walk, the calf muscles require more oxygenated blood. It's not uh, provided because of the blocked vessel. So you can't make energy in the calf muscles and you hurt, you, have, you cramp. This is called intermittent claudication. Now they took 30 patients with moderate and stable intermittent claudication. They withdrew all their medical therapy and antioxidants. Um, they, they withdraw vasodilators, pentoxifene and antioxidants. Pentoxifene was used in 1992 as an antiplatelet agent. We also know it's an immune modulator. We use it in heart failure and atherosclerosis. They took that drug away. They kept them on, on their heart meds and on anticoagulants. Marcumar was their term for warfarin or Coumadin that we would use today. So as a baseline assessment, they walk on a treadmill and you can see how far they could walk before pain developed, what was their absolute walking distance before they just had to stop due to pain. You look at lab studies. Treat them twice a week for five weeks with HOT. Um, in the HOT technique, prior to exposing the blood to ultraviolet, you oxygenate it. And this is a more cumbersome methodology that takes 40 minutes and it has not been shown to work better than ultraviolet. It's largely been abandoned. The other group received ultraviolet with the syringe technique, which is what we're using, 40 cc's of blood with two passes over 10 minutes. We actually treat 160 cc's. They used 40 cc's. And you're going to repeat the treadmill study at two, four, and eight weeks, and they found no side effects or change in lab values. Now, what you find, treadmill time improves. At baseline, pain-free walking distance is 106 meters, it steadily improves. Absolute walking distance is 213, it steadily improves. Here we have pain-free walking distance, maximum walking distance, significant improvements. Um, another study, 21 patients with claudication, you're going to treat them with whole body external infrared radiation or ultraviolet radiation. This is kind of like um, heliotherapy. First, infrared will make you sweat, and that is beneficial when you want to have detoxification, but infrared does not have any of the benefits of ultraviolet. If you just show ultraviolet at the skin, if you did enough of that, that might be beneficial. That'd be like heliotherapy, but one, you know, a few treatments is not going to help with claudication. Um, they did sham ultraviolet. They treated you, but they didn't turn on the lamp. There was no effect. With real ultraviolet, which is intensive but controlled sun tanning of your circulation, there was a positive effect. There was a threefold increase in mean walking distance. There was an increase in arterial venous oxygen difference. You're delivering oxygen to the cells. They're utilizing it better. Decrease in blood lactate. That means um, metabolism was, was upregulated. It was more complete, less acidosis. Blood was less viscous. It was more like wine than ketchup. Now, arterial blood flow was unchanged, only slightly improved. I don't think we're opening up blood vessels with ultraviolet, at least not in the short term, but what we're doing is we're improving blood flow. Why? We're dilating the arteries. You know, if there's a, a fixed narrowing, we're not going to affect that, but there's always a dynamic component. We're relaxing the vascular smooth muscle, increasing blood flow, and we're improving the flow characteristics of the blood. The red cells and the platelets are more malleable and pliable. They can wiggle through with these narrowed vessels. The blood is less viscous. Clot formation is lessened. So you're getting better blood flow through these narrowed vessels. And the oxygen capacity of the blood is improved. The red cells with their upregulated 2,3-DBG are going to dump that oxygen to the tissues. Thus, vitality is improved. Metabolism of the leg muscles improved. So you can walk three times as far before you have to stop due to pain. Renaud's phenomenon. This involves vasospasm of the blood flow to the digits. 
Now, this is not uncommon. The prevalence is 5% of men and 8% of women in the United States. It can be described as primary or secondary. Primary renodes, you have it, and we don't really know why. Secondary renodes is associated with, an, with a sec, another disease, a collagen vascular disease, or a disease of the blood vessels. And it involves constriction, increased sympathetic tone, and the blood is viscous. Um, it's thick. It's like syrup. And what is the treatment? Drugs to vasodilate, calcium channel blockers to open up the blood flow. Wear gloves because you're very, very cold sensitive. Um, in a pinch, you do a sympathetic sympathectomy. There are ganglia of collections of neurons of the sympathetic autonomic nervous system. They mediate vasoconstriction. So you can destroy them, and then there's less vasoconstriction, although that's a fairly extreme um, procedure. Let's see what effect ultraviolet will have. 42 men and women with symptomatic Renaud's phenomenon, 14 received the hot treatment, 28 received ultraviolet, eight sections over four weeks with reevaluation at eight weeks. Of the 28 ultraviolet patients, it was primary Renaud's in 10, secondary in 18, and 57% had a clear improvement. 32% um, were unchanged, only 7% were worse, which is very good in Renaud's, which is quite stubborn and refractory to treatment. Blood viscosity for the entire group was 1.76, normal is 1.6. In response to ultraviolet, the blood became less viscous. Individuals with secondary Renaud's, there's a greater contribution of blood viscosity to their symptoms. Their blood viscosity fell from 1.8 to 1.6. Fibrinogen is the precursor of fibrin clot. We don't want to see a high fibrinogen. If your fibrinogen's high, you're at greater risk for a heart attack or other vascular occlusive phenomenon. Your blood is, is more viscous, like ketchup or, or syrup. Fibrinogen falls in response to ultraviolet. Ultraviolet and cerebrovascular disease. Papers published in Russia um, in the 1990s. 50 Russian sailors aged 40 to 60 with early stage cerebral circulatory problems. You treat them with ultraviolet, eight sessions over four weeks. Re you reevaluate at eight weeks. The patients experienced subjective improvements. Their heads cleared, feelings of weight on their head disappeared, mood improved, they slept better, ringing in the ears was eased, felt more ready for work. 90 Russian patients aged 47 through 69, they had um, cerebrovascular disease due to atherosclerotic, hypertensive, or venous circulatory dysfunction. They're not responding to standard therapies. 35 served as controls, 55 received four to eight ultraviolet treatments, positive results in 87%, with 51% experiencing full resolution. Headache, dizziness, ringing in the ears improved, feelings of heaviness in the head and pain in the heart region improved, better sleep. These papers have not been fully translated. I got bits and pieces that have been translated, or the summaries were translated. That's why I don't have better numbers. And the control patients, my understanding is, they did not get better. The benefits were due to the ultraviolet intervention. 50 to 60 year old Russian patients with cerebrovascular insufficiency, improvement in brain efficiency and function, cognitive speed, verbal recall, concentration improves, blood flow to the brain improved. Um, here's an interesting study. 62 Russian patients with schizophrenia of one to 23 years duration. You treat them with ultraviolet, eight to 15 treatments on a daily basis. And I think they also used laser blood irradiation. It may have been one or the other or both. I couldn't tell from what has been translated, but 21 of the 38 treated with ultraviolet improved and five of the chronic schizophrenics normalized. How could this possibly be? Well, there, are, there may be some individuals with schizophrenia and other neurologic and psychological conditions, their problem is poor blood flow because white cells, red cells, and platelets are aggregating in the brain microcirculation. The brain doesn't have any, uh, any uh, oxygen, doesn't have any sugar, it doesn't work so well. I know that there are psychiatrists in the United States, uh, nutritional oriented psychiatrists, that are treating schizophrenia and related illnesses with blood thinners, like heparin or lumbrokinase, and some people get better. So there's many theories as to the cause of schizophrenia, but one may be vasculature, and in this paper that was not completely translated, there appeared to be a benefit of ultraviolet, which I thought was fascinating. Ultraviolet and hypertensive cardiovascular disease. 73 patients with stage two, that's moderate hypertension, divided in two groups. 
One group gets standard medical therapy, 49 patients get standard medical therapy plus laser blood irradiation. The fiber optic cable is threaded into the heart and you're treating the blood uh, within the heart. Blood pressure drops by 24%. Drug doses could be decreased by 40%. Less headache and dizziness, less ache in the heart area. The remission following course of treatment lasted four to eight months. Blood pressure begins to fall in six to 10 days. 14 hypertensive patients treated with ultraviolet. Systolic falls from 175 to 148. Stays below 153 for three years. The diastolic drops from 94 to 86. Stays below 83 for two years. Then after a period of time, it rose and then you would retreat them and they would resolve. And meds could be reduced in a third of the patients. So there's a beneficial effect in hypertension. Why? You're relaxing vascular smooth muscle. You're improving overall health. You're lowering inflammation and so blood pressure falls. Ultraviolet and coronary disease. 145 Russian men with severe ischemic heart disease. That refers to blocked coronary arteries. Um, five to 10 sessions of ultraviolet along with standard drug therapy. Of the 145 Russian men, 137 improved. They, they required less uh, narcotic pain medication, less nitroglycerin. 92 um, who improved, noted fewer episodes of angina, they could walk 1,000 meters a day. 45 improved, but not to the same degree. Another study of 45 Russian patients with unstable angina, that means their pain was red hot, it was unstable. 26 were experiencing angina following a heart attack. Treat with five to seven sessions of laser blood irradiation. Some degree of improvement in all 45. Decreased need for nitrates, nitroglycerin, less weakness, headache, and insomnia. Improvement in general condition. 24 Russian patients with acute myocardial infarction, an acute MI. You treat them with ultraviolet in the coronary care unit and drug therapy, and you treat them within the first six hours. 21 of the 24 experienced pain relief with ultraviolet. Only one of 24 died, which is pretty good. There was a decrease in PVCs. When your heart is irritated, when you're having a heart attack, there's electrical instability. You have extra beats, and that could lead to life-threatening arrhythmias, such as ventricular tachycardia, ventricular fibrillation. The frequency of PVCs quieted down. It returned in 12 to 24 hours, and we respond to repeat ultraviolet because it's having an effect on the autonomic nervous system. 50 Russian patients with acute heart attack 20 controls receive standard therapy, 30 receive standard therapy plus laser blood irradiation. They thread the wire into the atrium, they pulse the laser light frequency with the heartbeat, five to seven 40 minute treatments. Chest pain was lessened. At one hour, 15% of the patients treated with laser blood irradiation had severe pain versus 45 with controls. Pain resolved in the third, reduced in 22%. Narcotic requirement reduced to one-eighth the usual need. The need for analgesics decreased by two-thirds. Blood viscosity dropped. Platelet aggregation, platelet stickiness dropped. Fibrinogen fell. Reduced red cell aggregation within the microcirculation. Diastolic blood pressure falls. Improvements versus control maintained over six months of follow-up. Ultraviolet in refractory angina, 70 German men aged 32 through 70 with refractory chest pain. I mean, they're having pain despite maximal medical therapy, two-thirds with a prior heart attack, persistent pain despite two weeks of hospital care. Most required at least 10 nitros a day, some intramuscular morphine. You treat them with seven ultraviolets, and you follow them over two to eight months. Nitroglycerin requirement fell dramatically. Before ultraviolet, they need a lot more nitro than after. Clinical benefit, all 70 that with refractory angina got better. It was considered good success in 46. Decreased need for nitro. They could walk farther. Symptoms easier to treat. 46 were able to walk a kilometer a day. 31 to 39 with jobs were able to return to work. Benefits persisted over eight months in 38. If symptoms recurred, you treat another with an additional series of ultraviolet. Only seven died over one year of follow-up, and those tended to be the older patients. Intradermal clearance time of a radioisotope improved. In Russia, to measure the integrity of your circulation, they will inject a radio tracer under your skin and measure how long it takes for your circulation to pick it up and remove it. That improved. So overall circulation was improving. There was a two and a half fold decrease in fibrin monomers. The transition between fibrinogen and the fibrin clot is the fibrin monomer. We don't like to see that. That was decreased because ultraviolet improves fibrinolytic activity, the ability of your blood to dissolve clots. 
the chemical properties of hemoglobin were affected. There was photosynthesis of biologically active compounds, just as the um, uh, chloroplast um, absorbs photons of light energy in chlorophyll to create new compounds, the, the uh, hemoglobin in our red cells appears to do the same thing. And they didn't notice an effect on viscosity, fibrinogen, or fibrolinic activity, but the other studies, they did show benefits in those areas. Now, I'm a cardiologist. I'm an integrative cardiologist. That's why you're coming to see me or why you've heard of me. My colleague, Stephen Sinatra, and I uh, wrote a book together. It's five years old now called Reverse Heart Disease Now. And this talks about our approach to cardiovascular disease, at least our best practices five years ago. You can learn more about what we do on my website, heartfixer.com. Now, one therapy that was incredibly innovative 15 years ago was enhanced external counterpulsation, ECP. We brought this technique to town about 15 years ago. We were the second practice in the state, the 18th in the United States. And this is a treatment for refractory angina. And with the ECP, you lie on a padded table. We put large pneumatic cuffs, big blood pressure cuffs over your calf, thigh, and abdomen. We hook you up to an EKG. And on your finger, you wear a plethysmogram clip so we can tell when your heart is, is relaxing and contracting. And what we do during diastole, when the heart is at rest and ready to receive blood, we inflate the cuffs, one, two, three, generating a diastolic pressure wave to jam blood back into the coronary arteries. When the heart's getting ready to contract again, we, we, we release the pressure and the blood vessels dilate so the heart is ejecting blood into a vacuum. That decreases the workload of the heart. That's called afterload reduction. So if this is your arterial waveform, we reduce the systolic wave, we're reducing the work of the heart, and we're, we're providing diastolic augmentation, so we're going to jam oxygenated blood back into your arteries when the heart is open and ready to receive it. These are the tracings that we receive in our patients. We have to go from a dominant systolic wave to a dominant diastolic uh, wave. And with this, we are enhancing the formation of natural bypasses. When you have a blocked artery, natural bypasses will begin to form up from a good to the back ar bad artery following the pressure gradient. We increase blood flow into the good arteries and enhance the flow of collaterals. And we will treat you 35 sessions, 35 one-hour sessions, and we leave you with wider uh, more elaborate collaterals. And we're affecting not just your anatomy. To affect your anatomy, we must first affect your physiology. Uh, um, ECP has an antioxidant effect. It improves endothelial function, the ability of the artery wall to vasodilate and to make nitric oxide. In animal studies, you can show a, a, an immune modulating effect. Um, white cells infiltrate the plaque they make inflammatory mediators such as C-reactive protein. This is attenuated with ECP in animal models. When we treat you humans with the ECP, we see a reduction in the levels of inflammatory mediators such as tumor necrosis factor alpha. So um, ECP has an immune modulating effect. Because we're improving collateral flow and improving your physiology, your symptoms improve and your nuclear stress studies improve. And I've treated I don't know, 1,200, 1,500 patients with ECP, most of those with refractory angina, with good results. And of course, my interest is um, utilizing ultraviolet along with ECP. If we treat you with ultraviolet, we make your blood less viscous, we improve the ability of the blood to transport oxygen, and we're going to pump this new and improved blood in your coronary arteries, we anticipate a synergistic effect. Back to physiology, vasocare and heat shock protein expression. This is my last technical slide. Major autohemotherapy is a European technique. We would remove 10 cc's of blood from peripheral vein, and outside of your body, ex vivo, we're going to stress it. We're going to heat it up, we're going to apply ozone and ultraviolet irradiation. Then we, tr we inject the blood into a muscle, and many clinical benefits occur. It's kind of like ultraviolet blood irradiation, only we're injecting into a muscle. Um, exactly how it works, 
I'm not sure because all the papers were in German and Russian. They've not been translated. But I know that it's beneficial. Um, one of the things that occurs is the cells commit suicide. This is called apoptosis. And somehow that downregulates the immune response. Um, this therapy is anybody can do it, so it's not patentable in the United States. Now, if something's not patentable, you're not going to spend $20 million to get it FDA approved. So a Canadian company came up with VasoCare. This is a modification of the technique that was unique. They had a new device that was potentially patentable. Thus, they spent a lot of money to demonstrate efficacy to achieve FDA approval. And you draw 10 cc's of blood from the peripheral vein, you heat it, you apply ozone, which is kind of like an ultraviolet effect, and you apply ultraviolet irradiation, and then you inject the blood into a muscle. And in some small studies, they showed benefits in humans. Vasodilatation, the platelets are less sticky, endothelial function improves. They did small studies in Renaud's heart failure and peripheral vascular disease, showing an improvement. It is available as an approved therapy in Europe for the treatment of heart failure. It is not FDA approved in the United States. They did a study and they showed an improvement, but it wasn't marked, so the FDA decided not to approve it for the use of heart failure, but it is available in Europe. Um, here we're going to look at a study of VasoCare on heat shock protein physiology. Now, if you're interested in immune mechanisms of cardiovascular disease, and you have no choice if you're going to be one of my cardiovascular patients, because this is all I, I want to talk about, and we have a three DVD presentation with all kinds of science. If you think I gave you too much science today, look at that um, presentation. But anyways, um, let's say you have an infection, a respiratory infection with C pneumoniae. Your body will recognize antigenic determinants, proteins on the C pneumoniae is foreign, you're going to mount an immune response. So the C pneumoniae knows it's in trouble. It's being attacked by the host immune system. So what it will do, it will elaborate heat shock proteins. These proteins stabilize the cell membrane of the bacteria and make it more resistant to stress. These are kind of like, we're going to circle our wagons, the Indians are going to attack. Well, then our immune system will mount an immune response to the chlamydia heat shock proteins, and we're going to kill it. So we amount an immune response against the bacterial proteins and their defensive heat shock proteins. Now, these heat shock proteins are really effective, and they've been conserved by evolution. And that means that the amino acid sequence of human heat shock protein is 98% the same as that of bacterial heat shock proteins. Well, that's not a problem if we're healthy, but if our cells are unhealthy, because we smoke, because we're diabetic, because we have atherosclerosis, because we're full of toxins, our cells will be distressed. They will elaborate heat shock protein. And our immune system will be confused, and the immune response to bacterial heat shock protein can cross-react against the heat shock protein expressed by our cells and cause autoimmunity. Smokers have more heart attacks in the winter than in the summer. Why? Because they get infection in the winter they mount an immune response to bacterial heat shock proteins. The cells lining their artery wall are expressing heat shock proteins because they've been damaged from the tobacco smoke. They have a greater uh, risk of heart attacks. Now, all the cells of the vascular wall, the endothelial cells that line our arteries, the vascular soothe muscle, and the white cells that infiltrate the artery can express heat shock proteins. If you have atherosclerotic plaque, by definition, these are damaged and distressed cells. Damaged and distressed cells elaborate heat shock protein. The greater your plaque, the more inflamed your plaque, the more heat shock protein is elaborated. The more sensitive you are to a vascular event when your body fights an infection, which is why we often see people come in with their first heart attack a few days after an infection. Or if you have known cardiovascular disease, if you have an infection, we're very worried about that activating your atherosclerosis because your immune defenses against the bacteria are going to attack the uh, cells lining your artery. They found that VasoCare lowered expression of heat shock protein in monocytes. Those are the immune cells that play a role in atherosclerosis, but they did not affect the polymorphonuclear leukocytes. Those are the ones that kill bacteria. 
So I thought that was interesting, and it may be one of the mechanisms by which ultraviolet or other oxidizing therapies are beneficial as immune modulators in atherosclerosis. So they, they carried a study of vasocare in experimental atherosclerosis. They took 22-year-old LDL receptor double knockout mice. These mice did not have LDL cholesterol receptors in the liver. If they are on a pristine diet, they do great. But if you give them a high cholesterol, high fat diet, because they cannot pull it into the liver, they will have severe atherosclerosis. So this is a, an animal model of human bad diet atherosclerosis. They divide the mice in three groups. Control group, one group gets a high cholesterol diet and sham vasocare care therapy. A third group gets the high cholesterol diet and real vasocare care therapy on days 29, 30, and 42. You sacrifice all the mice on day 26, look at their cholesterol level, the development of cutaneous xanthomas. If you have high lipids, they will deposit under your skins. We'll see these little pouches of cholesterol under your eyes and on your arms. And they looked at the degree of plaque formation atherosclerosis in their aortas. The cholesterol level skyrocketed with the bad diet. The vasocare therapy had no effect on the cholesterol level, and nor would we expect that. The xanthoma score, how much of the cholesterol is being abnormally deposited in your skin, was lessened. So the cholesterol level is still high, but your body's response to the high cholesterol, this abnormal response depositing the skin, was lessened. The degree of plaque in the aorta was lessened from 30% to 9%. The degree of plaque along the aorta decreased along the higher length of the aorta, 4% of control diet, 33% on the high cholesterol diet. High cholesterol diet in 18% was reduced. So it's not the high cholesterol, it's the immune response to high cholesterol. You could attenuate it with vasocare. This is somewhat of an extrapolation, but I'm assuming that we also will attenuate it with ultraviolet blood irradiation. Um, the American experience in the 30s and 40s, there were no series published, but I got some information looking at the minutes of the meetings of the ultraviolet blood irradiation society. In the chapter on diseases of the cardiovascular system in their manual, there's a nice quote, Rebeck was the only early worker with the audacity to use ultraviolet in acute coronary occlusion, which is acute heart attack. Rebeck treated nine patients with acute heart attack between 39 and 43. Shortness of breath was relieved immediately, obviating the need for extra oxygen. Shock when present rapidly resolved. And Rebeck would treat them with maintenance therapy every month or so. And then he was called up for World War II. And four of the patients no longer had Dr. Rebick pushing them to have maintenance therapy. They dropped out and they died. Five patients kept up and did well, and Rebick continued to treat, treat them uh, when he returned from uh, active duty. Eberhard and Miley treated several patients with chronic coronary disease. I don't know how many, they just said several. Their general condition markedly improved. EKG findings improved. Ultraviolets kept up over three to five years with improvement maintained. Dr. Olney, in his 12-year experience, treated patients with acute MI, acute heart attack, and heart failure. Now, he postulated that in the heart attack zone, there's a zone of circulatory anoxia, cell death, surrounded by a rim of ischemia. We call this the ischemic penumbra. Those cells could still be recovered if things go in the right direction. And these dormant and at-risk cells, in this area, there's inflammation and edema. Well, ultraviolet reduces inflammation and edema, and it promotes oxygenation, so we would hypothesize that ultraviolet used early in the course of a heart attack would salvage myocardium. And he treated his patients and noted pain improved beyond that of opiates, and the patients required less narcotic therapy. So he integrated ultraviolet blood iteration to his, his best current care with positive results, kind of like what Dr. Poli and I do with new therapies. We have a problem that we cannot solve completely and everybody with our best therapies, so we look for new ideas and we add them into our best therapies to get better results, just as Dr. Olney did. And he felt it was best to treat patients as soon as you could, and for certain within 24 hours, then is needed for symptom control over eight weeks, then taper down as tolerated. RL, a middle-aged female, presented to his office January 17th, 1957, with prolonged chest discomfort. She was hospitalized, ultraviolet was carried out, she felt better. Then on the 21st at 6 o'clock, she had severe pain, she's nauseated, she's ashen gray. The heparin was available then, so they anticoagulate her, give her Demerol for pain, 
atropine to, to stimulate her heart rate. Papaverine is a vasodilating agent that we don't use anymore. They gave her everything they had, and she wasn't getting better by 9 o'clock. Her condition was grave. She felt terrible. So uh, they treated her with urgent ultraviolet. One hour later, the pain's gone. She gets a good night's sleep. She receives ultraviolet the 22nd, the 26th, the 31st, and then weekly for three months. She needed ultraviolet every four to five days in the hospital, or symptoms would return. Then they treat her weekly over uh, the first three months, and they felt she would have died and that she was saved with ultraviolet. And indeed she was, and they needed to keep up with it to keep pushing oxygen into those ischemic cells, reduce the inflammation, quiet down the immune system. Then after discharge, they were able to taper it out. Um, in acute congestive heart failure, they noted prompt relief of cyanosis, that's the discoloration of the skin due to low oxygen and shortness of breath. Seven-year-old woman admitted on uh, March 3rd, 54, with terminal heart failure. She's cyanotic in appearance. Her heart's enlarged. Her pulse is threading and irregular. She's inflamed. Her white count's elevated. She has a temperature. Her left knee was swollen and painful. There was another inflammatory condition involving her knee. She'd had a prior good response to ultraviolet, but she felt better and didn't come back for more. That was a big mistake on her part. So they treat her with acute ultraviolet on March 3rd, 5th, 8th, and 15th. Rapid improvement the first treatment. Ultraviolet's continued. Her heart gets better. The knee pain gets better. So whatever was going on in the knee was inflammatory.